Hi, hey. hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm really good. I'm I'm so like you know impressed that I've actually joined the Instagram live for the first time. So oh, that's, that's exciting. Well, I was going to say you're very efficient because I usually have a little bit of preamble where the Wi-Fi cuts out. I can't find the person. Um, so you know that was very quick off the mark. I'm impressed. Yeah, no, I've been standing here ready for the last five minutes. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Right. Um, hi everyone, and welcome to today's in conversation with series. And this afternoon, we are joined by a very special guest and a dear friend of Albright, the incredible Nimco Ali OBE, to discuss today's topic, how to be an everyday activist. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Nimco for those of you who don't know um, everything there is to know about her. Nimco is a Somali-British social activist and writer. In 2010, she co-founded Daughters of Eve, a non-profit organisation which works to protect girls and young women who are at risk from female genital mutilation, FGM, as well as the Five Foundation in 2019, which leverages resources for frontline activists. Nimco has helped to position FGM as a central issue in ending violence against women and girls. Her professional experience has included working for counter-terrorism -ter within the civil service, supporting the rights of girls in the UK as part of Girl Guiding UK and as network lead on the Girl Generation, the DFID-funded anti-FGM social change communications in initiative. She's also a leading commentator in international media on the rights of girls and women. And her debut book, What We Are Told Not To Talk About, was published last year. In 2014, she was awarded Red Magazine's Woman of the Year Award and placed at number six on the Women's Power Woman's Hour Power List. Most recently, she was named by the Sunday Times as one of Debrett's 500 most influential people in Britain. Um, Nimco was also the winner of Changemaker Woman Award in our inaugural Brightlist Awards, which we hosted in March earlier this year. Huge welcome to the amazing Nimco. Now, listen, before we um, kick off with the questions, some of you have pre-submitted questions, and I'll get to as many as I can um, towards the end, but it, don't be shy. While we are talking, please feel free to post questions, and I'll, I will, um, I'll try and ask Nimco as we go. Right, Nimco, you and I have met many times and you are an absolute inspiration. But before we start, I just want Thank to you. ask you, how are you dealing with lockdown? Um, I'm, I think I'm okay. So I'm on my own. So nine weeks, is, well, nine weeks, I think it's like, it's, it's, it's day 50 has been quite intense. And unfortunately, because of the situation um, of, of COVID taking attention away from issues like FGM, we are really busy. So yeah, so I'm good. And I'm like, you know, constantly... Like, you know, acknowledging the privileges I have and just keep working. So, yeah, I'm doing okay. So, have you, and, you're, and you're on your own, are you managing to get out every day? For a bit of um, well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not managing to get out every day because I just seem to wind myself up with people not socially distancing. So, I'm going out like every other day. But, yeah, it's fine so far. I'm, I'm, not, I'm lucky enough to, to have a garden, so, and the sun is out, so it's great. I just made some friends with um, some, some foxes that come to visit me at night. I think that's the only company I have at the moment. <laughs> and um, yeah, so she comes around 11 o'clock every night with her cubs, which is quite cute. That's so cute. That's one of my, one of our team, one of my senior team is in the countryside and she's made friends with some pheasants and some partridges. She gets quite distressed when they don't come and visit her. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, listen, we'd love to hear about the incredible work that you do. Can you give us some background on the Daughters of Eve and the Five Foundation and the work that you do? Yeah, so they basically, uh, one is, was a national campaign and one is an international global facing campaign. So Daughters of Eve essentially started as, as the impetus for me. So my niece um, was, was born in 2011 and I really just wanted to make sure that girls like her were safe from FGM because I was subjected to FGM, female genital mutilation at the age of seven. And one of the key things that was more painful than the actual act of FGM was, was how I was constantly ignored by massive institutions, whether it was education, healthcare, policing, everything else. Everybody knew I was British, everybody knew I had FGM, but there was that kind of gap of thinking, well, this is a cultural thing. And I was constantly dismissed and others. And I really wanted my niece not to go through those same experiences. And we've been immensely privileged that, um, that the coalition government of 2010 and then the, 
and, and the conservative governments of the last um, decade have really moved forward with that. And in terms of the Pi Foundation, which we started last year, which is the global partnership to end FGM, essentially, as an African woman of the diaspora, I know that there are 200 million women globally affected by FGM, but a large number of those women are on the continent of Africa. And the reality is that we could talk about things like poverty, hunger, deprivation in Africa, but all these things are rooted in the fact that women are not seen as active citizens. And FGM is the key element to that. So what we really want to do is to work with women through economic empowerment. And that's one of the things why I really love what you guys do at Albright. It's about giving women power over their own destinies by ensuring that they're leading businesses and communities. Um, and you've talked before about the sort of stigma around this whole topic. I think um, there was that lovely quote that you said, it's not very British to talk about fannies. So yeah. just talk to us a bit about how you sort of overcame that um, embarrassment, if you like, to get this uh, as, a, as a topic that people were aware of and talking about. I think humour was a key element to break that down and the patriarchy and those people that were... So there's, there's an interesting saying, I was never embarrassed um, about my anatomy and I was never embarrassed by the issue of FGM, but everybody around me was embarrassed. And there was also a lot of cultural sensitivity in the, the sense that this happened to me because I was brown and because I was Somali and not because I was a girl. And I really wanted to change that. I really wanted to tell the broader community that I was growing up within, which is the Western British community, that actually they had a role to play in ending this brutal practice. So ultimately I had to kind of um, suck it up and make like, you know, make a joke about it to, in order to make people feel, feel comfortable. But the reality is as soon as I started talking about the issue of FGM, the people that really cared, which was really interesting, were um, very pale and male men who had, who actually could have just walked away saying, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not a woman. Um, I don't live in a community where FGM is an issue. But they really listened because they really saw the humanity. And that's what I really wanted to do. I didn't want to talk about the different types of FGM. I, I just want to talk about it being horrible, painful, and for something that we had a massive role to play in ending. And do you think with the help of your voice and the sort of, I mean, I, I was absolutely horrified. I, I um, helped support a campaign um, through UN Women yeah. um, last year. And that 200 million stat is just absolutely shocking. Have you seen the incidence of FGM dropping since it has become more of an open topic for discussion? Um, I think, well, in places like um, Kenya, it, it, it has dropped. And the reality is that FGM is not going to end because we talk about it. FGM is going to end because we talk about it and we support women. And one of the key elements, that, and, that, and that's why we look at ending FGM through economic empowerment through the Five Foundation, in Kenya, lifting women out of poverty, giving women access to money to start businesses and to decide when they get married, who they get married to, means that they're, they're, they're able to make decisions for their daughters at the moment. And that the reality is that there is no woman who's been subjected to FGM who are the key people who will also cut up their daughters that don't know FGM is painful. But the reality is that if you, if, if, you, if you don't have any other means of supporting your family and the only way for your daughter to survive is to marry her off, and marriage is within the element of her being cut, then there's nothing she can do. So ultimately where FGM is decreasing is not because of awareness, but it's all about empowering women. So the more um, access where women have to finances and education, then incidents of FGM do go down. But we are also seeing, as we keep talking about the harms around FGM and not necessarily the human rights abuses, a lot of places have started to medicalize FGM. And one of the key um, successes that has come out in the last, two or three weeks has been Sudan yes. and Sudan going forward to ban the FGM and that came about not because of UN um, um, like you know stats and not because of UN um, work but it became because or, or NGOs it became because the women of Sudan saw that they had a voice within this new emerging democracy so I think that there are two things that go hand in hand economic empowerment of women and access to democratic process within those countries. So let's talk a little bit about finding your um, voice. I've got another quote that I love of yours, which was, FGM was the patriarchy's way of trying to break me and keep me silent, but it made me the loudest person in the room. So what gave you the confidence um, to use your voice and to find your voice, if you like, and speak up? Yeah, um, I think so. I realised, like, you know, a lot of the time I thought that this was all down to me. But since the passing of my grandmother and having a real conversation with, with my mum, I really realised that it was the women around me who didn't 
like you know they, they had no power to stop the FGM but they had all the power in the world to ensure that I was educated and I wasn't silenced and I wasn't made to feel ashamed of this thing that, that had happened to me so I think for me it was a search in answers as to what this act of violence was and why it was so painful and why nobody wanted to talk about it and also the ability to have the freedoms to search out for those um, answers and as a as a 13 year old I found Noel at the Salawi which is an incredible who is an incredible Egyptian um, feminist and writer and and the fact that she was also e um, echoing the same things that I was saying which was a real issue with the way that my mother and women around me were reacting to FGM but also being but calling the act brutal was something that gave me the ability to believe that this kind of voice deep down within inside of me and was actually right I just it was completely uncomfortable I just thought FGM was really stupid and that was me as a child I didn't have any context of criminality I knew it was painful I knew it was stupid and I just wanted to find answers to those um, yearning questions and and I was privileged that I had parents and a grandmother that that didn't really stop me from wanting to find those answers was it um, intentional? Because you said before that you used your um, your sort of humour. You know, you, you've used humour, and obviously you've humanised it as well. Because you thought from a personal standpoint, did you did you always intend to to use that sort of tone, or did that develop as you became more of a vocal activist? No, no, I think that's just been the way that I've dealt with it. Being somebody that struggled to communities and cultures, well, one being British and one being Somali, and people constantly misunderstanding each other. And I do think for someone like me who's been through so much, but yet so loud and so vocal, I completely understood how scary and just like, you know, that that could be to people. So I think if I try to be funny, then whatever serious stuff I'm saying is always taken with a light heartedness, but they really get to the point. And it's a lot easier to get something through to people when they're when they're comfortable and they're finding humor in it because i do think humor is the biggest antidote within like you know these crises and i'm like you know fgm is brutal it's terrible i like you know there is literally no words for it but i need to take people with me and if, if you take people with you then they actually get the humanity of the conversation not not just this um anthropological look of what fgm is and talking to africans and stuff like that so it's always been a way that i've worked and a way that i've kind of had to deal with a lot of the brutality that I've personally seen in, in, in my life as well, whether it was FGM or civil war. And has that worked with all the audiences? Because you mentioned that you've been supported certainly by sort of men in suits, if you like, but you've also seen that the massive change happens on the ground with women making the change happen for themselves. So, so have you sort of had to hone that depending on the different audiences you've talked to? I think the humour ha has always been quite similar because honestly, it's really weird. And I say this as an African woman who's 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 grown up around African women is that African women and Etonian educated men seem seem to have the same sense of humour, <laughs> and seem to have the same sense of like um, way of just like okay, fine, let's just do things. So there is actually not a dissimilar dissimilar um, freedoms between like you know very well educated white men and women who, who are the kind of the rocks of Africa. And the reality is that when I go to Africa and I'm having these um, and conversations, whether it's in Gambia or Kenya or Somaliland, nobody wants pity. And I think that's the main thing why when we first started this campaign, mm -hmm. I said, I'm a survivor, not a victim of FGM. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, and, and a lot of these white men in power don't want you to come to them as a victim. And I don't want them to look at me as a victim. I want them to say, well, if she could survive anything, then there must be something within that. And I think that's the respect that I've actually had for a lot of these men is that they listen because they, they really wanted to understand and see what they could do. Because to say to um, a tall white guy, to, to, like, you know, to go up to Jacob rees and say, I want you to help end FGM. He's thinking, like, what role do I have to play in ending FGM? But as, 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 as some of the most privileged men on the planet, they have all the roles to play in terms of ending FGM. So I have had to, like, you know, alter the way I talk to people, but not ironically, um, African women on, on the front line and these Etonian uh, men. What I've, what I've had to do is that sometimes I've had to put certain battles aside in order to have a conversation. I had a really interesting conversation recently with, with somebody that has incredible power and is really passionate about ending FGM and really empowering women, but they weren't interested in hearing about access to abortion or sexual re reproductive health rights. And I thought, okay, fine. 
I would rather give women in Africa the ability to have a democracy and elect people that would give them access to contraception than, than, than for me to fight a G7 leader on this. Because even if he and I agree in the end, that, that hasn't changed anything, but it's going to waste time in terms of really getting impact for women globally. So I've had to change my um, tone, but it wasn't really between those two communities. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, let's talk a bit more about activism. So it doesn't always have to be about impassioned protests. There are small things that every one of us can do to make our world a better place, fitting it into our everyday lives. What are some of the small things that you would encourage us all to undertake to make a change? Um, yeah, I think, the, well, for me, what, what I've been really impressed by since this lockdown is how conscious I am about what I consume and how I recycle and, and how I do these things. Because we're always so busy that we're not actually doing the little things that impact our own community so i think um shopping locally supporting your neighbors having comp like you know just being kinder to people and also ensuring that because our streets and our areas are not being cleaned as 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 much as possible to be really conscious about things like that so i think local activism is as simple as like you know if you are only allowed an hour a day make sure you only stay out for an hour a day and you are actually very um like, you know, conscious of other people around you. Mm, okay. Right, I've got some great questions here. Um, I've already got something I'm passionate about, but how do I start my campaign? Um, I think really doing research because there is no such thing as an original idea. Everybody else, there, there is literally somebody else out there who's probably had the same idea as you. So I think that is the most powerful thing about social media is that there is probably a hashtag or somebody else that's talking about that. And there is power in number as well, in numbers. So really research and see if anybody else is doing it. If they're not doing it, then start to ask for, like, you know, ask, um, asking for help. But just you using your voice is the key thing I would say to start off with. Yeah, and this sort of leads on this, this next question. Um, there are so many issues I'd love to speak up about, but I'm not an expert, so don't feel qualified. What should I do? Um, just go with your gut. And I think mm -hmm. even if you, if you can't say those things out loud, then support a campaign. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are out there that agree with you. And I think that's one of the things that I'm finding at the moment is like everybody wants to say everything about everything. But the reality is that there are experts that we need to be listening to. So I think if you care about something, if it's personal to you, then there, there is nothing more political than being personally um, open about your, um, about, um, about, about your conversations. But I think if, if it's your truth, then you don't have to be an expert because you've lived it. Yeah. Now, um, this one, I've seen this uh, come up a lot. How do you get over the absolute terror of public speaking is the next question. Oh, I just, I never take myself seriously. And I think uh, one of the, like, you know, I should start writing things down. I just go up and I just make it up as I go. Look, I, you're I so eloquent. Look, I've heard you speak several times. You've done panels and things with me before. And you, it just comes to you naturally, or it certainly seems that way. Well, thank you. But um, I always look back at it afterwards and thought, I wish I'd said something more impressive or something more precise. But I just think for me, like, doing something like this is something that I'm really passionate about and I and I always well the trick that I always play is that I'm not talking to the room I'm always talking to the girl beyond that room who who wants to hear somebody like me say say, say something that 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 um that really re resonates with them and I think that's always been the really powerful thing is the fact that I've been in rooms where it felt like that person was talking to me. So I think if you are having a personal campaign, then I think just being as true and as honest to other survivors and to yourself is, is a great thing. And also I would add to that just practice. So I yeah. think people have this idea that they're suddenly going to be thrust onto a sort of stage in front of 500 people, but actually just speaking up in smaller groups um, to start with until you feel like you find your authentic voice would be my, um, my tip. Um, right. Um, what tips would you give to those that are met with backlash and blockers to encourage them to remain motivated, resilient and persevere through the tough times? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I just I think, you know what, just keep faith in your um, story. I think I think there is nobody that can believe in you as much as you, you can believe in yourself. So I think, do you know what, recently I've been listening to a lot of Michelle Obama mm -hmm. and I think she resonates a lot of the things that I've said. It's like just actually having faith in your story and actually believing that you're the only one that can really tell it and do any justice to it. And you will, and also remember a failure is a, like, you know, is a fall forward. So don't give up just because you've kind of been knocked down. I've been knocked down. I've like, you know, 
I've taken a break and when you need a break, take one. But um, ultimately, I just think just keep faith in your story. And like, you know, I think God has a plan for you and that will work out. But you must have had times where you've been really knocked. Um, and there's another question here, which sort of links onto that about how do you deal with the trolls and negativity on social media? And sometimes, you know, you, you, you just have times where it's, you feel knocked back and everything's a no and everything's a challenge. How do you deal with, with A, kind of getting back up the next day, bit feeling more resilient and feeling like yeah. you can do, fight the fight again, if you like? And how do you specifically think about social media? Um, I th do you know what? Social media is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. I think I don't think our, our, our campaign will be as impactful as it is right now without the fact that we had social media and politicians being able to pick up things on on Twitter and I'm not going to stand here and say that I'm a superhero and nothing hurts because it does hurt and I have there have been moments where I've like you know truly been broken and I sometimes just think I'm just trying to end FGM it's like literally like why can't you all agree with that but I've come back to it because again it's just the whole point of having faith in your own narrative and having faith the fact that you can seek to push things forward and, and understanding that I'm not the first person to do this campaign. I stand on the shoulders of incredible women and of giants who are from the African continent who've done so much more than I could ever dream of. But give yourself a break and it's fine to have a moment where, where you want to take a break and have a, um, a step back. And I think keep, keep checking in with friends because I don't really want to force women, specifically women in, in this field, to overshare about their experiences and also constantly have to feel like they have to be they have to keep getting up and taking the knocks. It's fine. Ask for help. It's fine to step back. But ultimately, like, you know, thing, things will work out. And, like, so I've gone to a point where I've just literally deleted um, Twitter off my phone because I just didn't need to have that constant, um, like, you know, anger and, like, vigil in my kind of hand all the time. So, yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword, but give yourself a break. Yeah, and I would just also just add to that, um, ignore the comments. So, you know, um, Debbie and I went on Sky uh, News last week and, you know, similarly, we're talking about equality. So as it seems like a sort of no brainer and then yeah. you could actually get yourself. I, I just don't read them, but, you know, my kids might read them and they get really upset with the comments. But you have to just be able to kind of block it out again. It's practice. <laughs> practice to block it out and honestly I've also I've also learned one of the things about men specifically and also some 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 others is the fact that it's not really me that's triggering them it's something within me within so it's basically a woman who actually did something to them so I've started to learn not, not to take it personally and even if they can be really nasty and personal about their statements a lot of the time it's not about you it's, it's about something else that's deep down within them that is great advice yeah, I haven't thought about that. That's really good advice. So you talked about reaching out for support and obviously the Albright's all about sisterhood and I know yeah. that you founded um, both of the charities um, with other women. Who are the women who make you feel inspired? So who do you turn to when you need to pick yourself up? Um, I think it, it, it was always my grandmother and I think I will always remember like, you know, like, you know, an illiterate woman who subjected to FGM and got married as a youngster to, to be the granddaughter, to be her granddaughter. It's in incredible how each generation pushed forward. But I'm also like, you know, constantly um, like, you know, in, in awe of incredible women on, on the front line, Africa, you and Debbie. And I remember when I first started um, the activism, it was Kathleen Moran, who was the first person that she was just so incredible in the fact that she had no shame about talk, talking about things that we all felt so ashamed of and really spoke in the same tone that I did, which was meant to be funny, like, you know, just not taking yourself too seriously. So I think I've, I've always got, um, an, like, you know, an eclectic collection of women and also some men that I, that I really look up to. And I think we always forget that men can be our allies and a lot of incredible men have been my allies. And actually, I co-founded the Five Foundation with a guy who's a feminist, so they can be our allies. Look, I mean, we absolutely believe that, you know, enlightened men need to come on this journey to reach equality with us. And I know that you've referred to Boris Johnson, who I know is a, a friend of yours, as a real feminist. What did you mean by that? Um, do you know what? Any man that's in a position of power that can really see the value in girls and women is is somebody that I consider as a feminist I think like you know you don't have to be out every day marching and speaking for feminist slogans in order to like you know to be called a feminist it's like do you want to deliver and I think 
the idea as foreign secretary saying that girls' education is, is a key to global prosperity, that is incredible. So a lot of foreign secretaries talk, talk about, like, you know, defence and war and all these things and access to education being at the core of a defence policy and now at number 10 in, in terms of, like, GIFID's um, plans. I think that's something, as a woman, I can really understand. And there's a, there, there's a statement that I always, like, you know, love, which it says, um, Solemn, do you see the potential of a man in a boy, but you always fear the woman in a girl? And men in leadership who don't fear the women and girls are incredible for feminists in that kind of state. So I think those, and, I, and he, he has the same qualities that I saw in my grandfather who couldn't do anything about FGM, but ultimately wanted to empower his daughters and his granddaughters. So yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of time for somebody who is a politician and cares about people he's not elected essentially to directly to care about. And you've always been politically active, so you were a civil servant, and then you actually stood for the Hornsey and Wood Green seat in the 2017 election. Yeah. Would you still like to be a politician? Do you see yourself as a politician someday? Um, no, I'm politically active. I think the reason why I took part of the Women's Equality Party was to make the principle of equality being good for all of us, as opposed to really being elected. I am political, but I'm not. I'm not like you know, actively a political beast. I. I'm not, um, I can never be tribal. And I think that's what politics has really become. And that's what I found really disheartening over, over the last, like, you know, five, six years is the fact that you are either one or the other. Mm -hmm. I, ca I come from a country that, who, whose generation, like my generation, were became refugees because of tribal politics. And I'm very concerned about tribal politics. So if there was the ability to, I would definitely love to work with government. I would love to work with in, within politics, but the idea of standing on a mandate of things that I don't 100% agree with, and I don't think I, I'm 100% any political party. So yeah, I wouldn't want to do that because I think that if you are going to stand for a political party, then you stand on their mandate. You don't get in and then start changing your mind about things. Mm. Um, okay, last question. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received throughout your career? Um, don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> and that was, and that was for my grandmother and I never take myself seriously. So I think that's one of the things that I would always live by. And as much as I achieve or whatever I get, even the idea of getting an OBE for talking about my vagina, it's just like, <laughs> what? I so yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, I think those are the kind, that's the thing that I would always take credit for, like not credit, but like, you know, take on board is never take myself too seriously. And also really understand that, like, you know, wh wh what you're doing is not achieving, like, you know, a massive goal, but it's pushing things forward for the next generation. Um, so yeah, so never take yourself too seriously is my kind of thing. Because then it allows you to really get over when, when people are really petty. So when we're like, you know, I've met a lot of petty people along the way and I've just had to laugh it off. Um, I've said the last question, but I'm just going to ask you one more thing. What is, what's next? We're out of lockdown. What's next? What are you doing? Um, do you know what? I th I'm going to come to the Albright yeah. and I'm going to and I'm going to talk to you and Debbie about hosting a party in Hollywood and in, and in New York and in London to really say that we are a global community of, of women, and like you know, like you know, female entrepreneurs are the future of Africa and they're the future of the world. So I hope if this lockdown teaches us anything is that we can go back to as business as usual and we need to start looking at localising a lot of the things and really ensuring that we trust women with their futures. Oh, well, I look forward to that. Love, yeah. Any excuse for a party, Nimco, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Um, thank you. Thank you so, so thank much. Thank you for, for having joining. me. Um, no, thank you. A huge thank you for your time and insight. Um, amazing Whistle Stop Tour. Someone just wrote um, in here, you know, 30 minutes of, of pure inspiration. So thank you so, so much. Um, make sure you tune in again uh, on Instagram Live tomorrow at 4.30 to join me in conversation with Julietta Dexter, CEO and founder of the Global Communal communication agency uh the communications store i'm also uh doing a zoom panel tomorrow at eight of some incredible female leaders talking about the future of marketing the media and communications um, and please do get in touch with any feedback or suggested themes that you would like to see if you miss any of our events or want to see more detail on what we've got lined up do check out IGTV and join our Albright Digital Membership for more exclusive events, online courses, content and inspirational stories from even more incredible women. Thank you all for joining uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. See you soon.